from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Hello and welcome to Kennedy Classics, a media outreach of D. James Kennedy Ministries. My name is Frank Wright and I want to encourage you to visit our ministry website at djameskennedy.org where you can find a robust collection of great digital, audio, video and print resources. Have you ever noticed how difficult it can sometimes be to see something clearly? A beautiful landscape may be obstructed by a collection of ugly buildings. Thick clouds can obscure the starry night sky. The beauty of ancient buildings falls beyond our sight because of pollution, decay, and corruption. Sometimes even looking out a dirty window confuses the spectacle of things beyond it. Leonardo da Vinci's great masterpiece, The Last Supper, is a good case in point. The most recent restoration of it was completed in 1999. And perhaps the most startling result was the discovery that Leonardo's underlying original work was a table setting of brilliant white, rather than the golden museum quality hues to which we had become so accustomed. Once again, time, pollution, and corruption concealing the master's artistry. And so it is with our own souls. Once cleansed by the blood of the Savior, we are new creatures in Christ, and our souls sparkle like the finest chandelier. But over time, and without careful attention, the accumulated grit of life in a fallen world and the sinful choices we make can darken and mask its purity. But what if it could all be renewed again? Here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with his message, The Sparkle of the Soul. The 51st Psalm is one of the great psalms, the greatest psalms of the Bible. It is the greatest of the penitential psalms. It's a psalm of David, which uh, he penned shortly after being confronted by Nathan concerning his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest, mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. And may God speak to our hearts and minds this day through this his holy word and may his name ever be praised. Amen. We have a beautiful chandelier at our house. It hangs over the dining room table. And uh, it's lovely silver and, and crystals all over it. I can say it's a beautiful one because I helped to pick it out. And uh, 
I've always had the job when we have our annual Christmas uh, staff party of shining the, sh cleaning the chandelier and cleaning each one of the crystals individually, which was uh, a rather long task until my wife discovered something you just spray on once and it's all cleaned automatically. But I have sort of grown a little distant from my chandelier, which I knew so intimately until recent years. But anyway, this is a thing of beauty to behold. I mean, it sparkles and it coruscates and it scintillates and it dazzles and it gives all the different hues of the rainbow when the light shines on it just right. And if you bump it, it also tinkles with a very musical sound, which reminds me of what the kind of sound that Poe must have been talking about when he talked about the silver bells, how they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight. And so it is that these various uh, crystals on the chandelier make a beautiful tone and a lovely sparkle. But the thing about them is that they don't sparkle unless they're clean. And that's the way it is with our souls. My sermon title is The Sparkle of the Soul. And that sparkle won't be there unless our souls are clean. It has been rightly said that the eye is the window of the soul. And it's interesting, I think, that when people suffer that disease, when the lens becomes clouded and they're not able to see, not only does it prevent the light from coming into them so that they can see, but it also prevents the sparkle of the soul from being seen. And so when our souls are clouded by the vile breath of sin and filmed over, we lose that sparkle. And that's precisely how David was when he wrote this psalm. You remember, <clears throat> He had been derelict in his duty. He had failed to go with the army into battle, and he was at home walking around on the top of the palace. And he happened to spy Bathsheba bathing. And being enticed, he lured her up to the palace, and he committed vile adultery, and then to cover up his sin, he compounded it with foul murder. Having committed two very grievous sins, and there was no forgiveness to be had for such sins in the Old Testament. There was no sacrifice for murder, and there was no sacrifice for adultery in the Old Testament sacrificial system. And that's why David says in this, in this psalm that thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would bring it. For there was none that could be offered. But David's heart is crushed. He has waited a whole year now. And during that time, all of the joy has gone out of him. All of the light has gone out of him. All of the sparkle has disappeared from his soul and from his eyes. The sweet singer of Israel is now singing nothing but doleful laments. He feels that the very bones within him are being crushed by the guilt that presses down upon him. He roars all the night long because of his anguish. And now God has sent Nathan, the prophet, to speak to him. A special gift from God, because that's what Nathan means, a gift. And this prophet came and told that wonderful fable that he invented for the occasion about two men that lived in a city. One was very rich and had many flocks and herds, and the other was a very poor man who had but one little ewe lamb that he had brought up in his own house, who drank out of his own cup and lay on his bosom, who was the pet of the family, uh, and he handled it and treated it as if it were a daughter. And it came to pass that a traveling man came to the home of the rich man, and the rich man spared to take of his own flocks and herds, and he stole the ewe lamb of the poor man, and he killed it and dressed it and ate it. And we're told that the anger of the king waxed greatly when he heard this story, and leaping from his throne chair and drawing his sword, he says, 
as the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. And Nathan said, Thou art the man. And then David wrote this psalm, pouring out his heart. Some many unbelievers had said, David was a hypocrite. Well, let me assure you, no hypocrite ever wrote a psalm like this. David was great in his sinning, there is no doubt of that. But he was also great in his repenting, and that's why he is called a man after God's own heart. Are you a great repenter? I mean, do you truly sorrow for your sins and truly turn from them as David did? Listen to his words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. This is amazing. David, in this daring prayer, looks into the future and foresees a plan which God has not even yet revealed, wherein he could forgive such transgressions as these which were not forgivable under the Old Testament code. The penalty for adultery was death. The penalty for murder was death as well. Blot out my transgressions. Now there are those that say that we can't change the past. There is nothing that can be done to blot out the things that we have done. Probably no one said this better or more in a more well-known fashion than, than Omar Khayyam in his Rubiat words that I suppose everyone has heard. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Not all your tears nor your tears wash out a word of it. There's nothing that can be done, said Omar Khayyam. Khayyam, by the way, means tent maker. Omar the tent maker. But there was a greater tent maker than he, Paul the tent maker, Paul the apostle. And Paul declared in Colossians, Christ, having forgiven all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, and took it and nailed it to his cross. Yes, the cross of Christ can blot out our transgressions. They can be washed clean only with the blood of Christ. When you study textual criticism, and the Bible has been criticized and critiqued as no other book in all of the world ever has, you learn a number of interesting things. And one of them concerns something that probably most of you never heard of, and that is palimpsests. Now, a palimpsest is a piece of papyrus or paper which had something written on it, but because of the scarcity and value of paper in those days, they blotted out or erased what had been written before and used it to write something anew. And we even find some of the Gospels that are palimpsests. And what a beautiful picture I think that is. Here we have taken our pen and paper, and with our lives, we have written a sordid story that includes all of the sins and all of the failures of our own lives. And God has not only blotted out all of the handwriting which was against us, but he has written over it a gospel of the life of Christ. And so that's what happens when we become a Christian. God looks at us, and he sees Jesus Christ, his life, is imposed upon us. His white robe covers us, and our sins are removed. And that God has done for David, and I thank God for me. I hope that he has done it 
for you. David confesses his transgressions, his iniquity, and asks to be cleansed from all of that. And he says, cleanse me from my sin. Now sin means moral evil. It is that which uh, we are all guilty of, for all of us have sinned in the sight of God. And David is asking to be cleansed from all of his faults and evil. For he says, I acknowledge my transgressions before thee, and my sin is ever before me. And when our consciences are awakened, we cannot get away from that sin. It returns in bold relief to appear before our eyes over and over again in the night seasons until we forsake it and confess it and repent of it. And if your conscience has ever been awakened because of some sin, you will know exactly what I mean. But David is interested in something else as well. He wants not only to have his sins pardoned and forgiven, to be washed externally, but he says also, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. He doesn't want simply an external forgiveness, but he wants an internal transformation. And wonder of wonders, that's what Christianity offers, that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds and hearts and souls. And a new spirit can be placed within us as Christ places his Holy Spirit in us. And he goes on to say in verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Is that the cry of your heart? Has the joy gone out of your faith and your soul is dim and covered over with all manner of grime? That's the interesting thing about our chandelier. You don't have to simply throw it into the muck. It all has to do is simply hang there and it gets dirty and dirtier day after day and takes away the sparkle and the tinkle and the joy of those that look upon it. Would you have God to restore unto you the joy of your salvation? But David wants more than that. He says, and uphold me with thy free spirit, because he knows he, his absolute weakness, prone to wander, now he knows himself to be. And he wants God not only to restore him, but to uphold him, to enable to continue to walk in a godly fashion and to lead a godly and clean life. And he cannot do that without the power of the indwelling spirit holding him up day by day. And we need to pray each day that God's spirit would come in and uphold our lives and strengthen us that we not fall into temptation. As soon as we begin to think that, oh, I would never do a thing like that. It's such pride as that that comes before a fall. Would you like to have that joy of salvation restored? Would you like to have the crystal chandelier of your soul cleansed and made to sparkle again? I would like to recommend to you something. Take your Bible today, tonight, when you're at home, open it and place it on the seat of your chair or your bed, wherever you kneel to pray. And I would urge you not merely to read it, but to pray it to pray those same prayers that David prayed. Because each one of us is a sinner. We may not have committed adultery or murder, but we are guilty of a hundred other sins, 10,000 times a hundred other sins, most of which we have forgotten, sad to say, but God knows them all. So pray that God would forgive you and blot out your sins and restore you and cleanse you and create a new heart within you and grant unto you the joy of your salvation again. And you will find that you can rejoice and you need to believe him. It is not enough to simply pray a prayer that God would forgive you. It is also important to believe that he has. And we have every reason to believe that he would, whatever the sin may be, where David in this daring prayer had no reason to believe that God would forgive him for murder or adultery. There was not even any sacrifice that could be brought. 
but we have every assurance that if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. St. Francis of Assisi was somewhere when he came across a man who was groveling on the floor. The man was in great anguish and he was saying, have mercy upon me, O God. Have mercy upon me, O God. O God, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. And he kept praying this over and over again. And St. Francis stood there and watched him for the longest time. And finally, the man, becoming aware of his presence, looked up and saw him there. And St. Francis made merely this one comment but I think it's one that we all need to hear. He said, I think he heard you the first time. And in our much speaking, we often demonstrate our little faith in the grace of God and his willingness to forgive our sins. You know, one of the reasons that, that many Christians don't witness, never lead anyone to Christ, it's because they have no sparkle in their soul. They have not the joy of salvation. The chandelier of their soul is grimy, grimy and covered with some kind of coat or film, and it's lost all of its sparkle and its tinkle. Notice what David says next. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. The secret of being a good witness for Jesus Christ is a cleansed soul. The sparkle in the soul is what shines out to others. Is that sparkle in your soul? I wonder if there's some here whose consciences toward their sin is so deadened that they're not even aware. I wonder if there's some here that would say, oh, that doesn't refer to me, I'm a good man. David didn't make any such pretenses, I'm a good man. Well, so-and-so made me do it. It was the circumstances. No. There were no mitigating circumstances that he pled. He acknowledged his sin and his iniquity and his transgressions and acknowledged that they were ever before him and that it was against God and God only that he had sinned. Murder is a grievous sin and adultery is a grievous sin because there are sins against people that are made in the image of the all-holy God. And it is ultimately against God that we commit our sins. And David knew that because the Spirit of God had opened his eyes and caused him to see the real heinousness of his sin. May some David speak, some Nathan rather, speak to your heart and open your eyes and say, thou art the man, thou art the woman. You are the one that is guilty. What is the sin that Nathan would speak to you about today? David said, as soon as Nathan pointed the finger at him, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. No equivocation, no vacillation, no excuses, no argumentation, no anger, though he could have had Nathan killed for saying that. I have sinned against the Lord. May the Spirit of God cause our sins to be confessed, repented of, and washed away. And may he restore the sparkle to our souls and grant us the joy of our salvation. May we pray. Father, there may be some here today who do not even know that salvation, who have never met.
personally the Lord Jesus Christ, who are yet in their sins and so filled are they with self-righteousness that they do not even see them at all, and they still protest their goodness. Oh God, I pray that you would pierce their hard hearts and open their blind eyes that they may see their iniquity for all that it is in the eyes of an all-holy God who cannot stand to look upon iniquity. And may they repent of it and turn in faith to the cross of Jesus Christ, whose blood alone can wash away every stain. We ask it in his name. Amen. I hope that the joy of your salvation is reflected in your life for all to see. But if not, it can. Did you just pray with Dr. Kennedy just now, confessing your sin and repenting and asking God to come into your heart to cleanse you and make you a new person? If you did, then Jesus Christ says, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. He also says that he has come to give life to the full. So no matter what our circumstances, we can know joy and have that sparkle that others will be drawn to. To help you learn more about the Christian faith, we'd like to send you Beginning Again. Dr. Kennedy wrote this book to help new believers learn how to read and study the Bible, how to pray, and even how to share their faith with others. And it's our gift to you when you write to our address or call our toll-free number. Just ask for Beginning Again. God bless you. How much of our lives, or the lives of those we love, is driven by guilt? We often have a sense that something is wrong, but can't quite put our finger on what it is. Only the forgiveness God offers us in Jesus Christ can lead to true cleansing and removal of guilt. Maybe you know someone who is locked in a destructive pattern of behavior they can't seem to break out of. Perhaps you yourself are struggling with internalizing God's forgiveness. We all want to be cleansed, to reflect God's beauty more clearly, and to have joy in our salvation. If you'd like a DVD copy of today's program to watch again, or to give to someone else as an encouragement, we'd be glad to send you one as our thanks for your generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6087, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free, 888-633-1728, or go online to djameskennedy.org. Our sin is real, but through the blood of Christ, God's forgiveness and cleansing is available to each one of us. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us on Kennedy Classics. We'll see you next time. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.